Last week, March 27th, America was horrified again as a 28-year-old young lady named Audrey Hale, dressed in camouflage, wearing a red hat, walked into a Christian elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee, Covenant School, and shot three nine-year-old students and three staff members. She shot Evelyn Dykus and William Kinney. She shot Haley Scruggs, a nine-year-old girl who was the pastor of the church's daughter. She also killed Cynthia Peake, a 61-year-old substitute teacher. She killed Catherine Kuntz, the 60-year-old principal that I was watching an interview that was the actual one that walked Stephen Curtis Chapman through one of the most horrific moments of his life when his young daughter got ran, run over by a car. It was that principal of that school that helped the Stephen Curtis Chapman, the Christian singer, to walk through one of the darkest moments of her life. And that principal, Catherine Kuntz, lost her life. And then Mike Hill, a 61-year-old custodian. What happened to Audrey Hale? To this former student of that school, of Covenant School, that K, K through, uh, through sixth grade. What happened to this young lady that would go on a shooting spree this last week? And what, in fact, what is happening to all these shoot within all these shootings? The attack was the 19th shooting at an American school or university in just this year. We haven't even hit Easter, and we already have 19 shootings in universities and schools. It's the deadliest since the Uvalde, Texas, which left 21 dead. And now, between Uvalde and today, there have been, I want you to think about this, there have been 42 shootings since Uvalde in America. 42 times that someone snapped and walked in. Folks, we're living in a powder keg society. It seems all over the country, somebody is waiting to explode. And how do you respond to this? What do we say? We have a message for a volatile society that can seemingly snap at any moment. It's one man said it like this, which seems true. He said, if we all live by an eye for an eye, the whole world would be blind. The only way out is forgiveness. This very well may be, I want you to hear me, but not, not using um, even uh, just, just uh, rhetoric here. This could be the most important message in the biblical worldview series for our society and a time bomb that's ticking all over our country. You cannot fight a spiritual problem with political legislation and laws. You cannot fight, what is this? You may rescue some, but still society remains unfixed, waiting for another horrible tragedy. And, and with all due respect, you cannot fix society in the halls of Congress and Washington, D.C. We need a revival. We need God to show up and do something in our country and all the countries that are watching around the world. We're experiencing, folks, I want you to hear me. We are experiencing the repercussions of an unforgiving population. We're experiencing the repercussions of an unforgiving population. We are experiencing violence in a world where people are living with unforgiveness, which is consuming them. That's why the glory of Christianity is to conquer its enemies by forgiveness. That's the way Christianity works. And folks, I, I, I don't know of any other thing to do today as we are approaching biblical worldview than for us to understand that F is gonna be for forgiveness. And I wanna to talk to you about acting like God today. Folks, listen to me, this is important, get this down. Forgiveness is me giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Keep that on the screen right now, keep that up there. Get your phones out, take pictures of that right now. Don't text somebody, take a picture of that. <laughs> forgiveness is me giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. See, unforgiveness is revenge in the flesh. That's what unforgiveness is. That's why, keep this in mind, church, the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis said it like this, to be a Christian means you forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in every single one of us. 
It's an amazing story about the struggle of forgiveness. Her book has reached tens of millions. Corey Temboon wrote the Christian classic, The Hiding Place. Corey and her family housed Jews during the Holocaust. The Nazis found out and put Corey and her entire family into the concentration camps. And all of them died except Corey Temboon. And she became a Christian and for three decades preached the gospel all over the world and miraculously was released from the Nazi concentration camp while all of her family, including her sister, her parents, died there. And it was the story of unforgiveness that is amazing to me. Listen to this. Corey, as she was coming to the end of her life, one day Corey was preaching in Munich, Germany, many years after the concentration camp. And as Corey was preaching in this church, she was standing at a pulpit like this, and as she was preaching, she noticed an individual in the audience. It was the guard from the concentration camp that would mock them and make them shower and to put fear in them like they were going to be exterminated that day. And in fact, it was the guard, that guard, the face of that guard that she saw that was responsible for her sister Betsy's death. And she's preaching and the man is sitting in front of her. Think of that for a moment. She recognized him, but he didn't recognize her. And after Corey finished preaching that day, he came up and said, Fraulein, I heard you mention Raven's, Raven's book, Brooke. I was a guard there, but since those days, I became a Christian, a follower of Jesus. I know that God forgives me, but would you forgive me? Listen, folks. She said, I want to read to you what Corey said. She said, I stood there paralyzed. This man is a monster. This is the, this is the preacher that Sunday. This man is a monster. He filled her with shame, misery every day and killed her sister Betsy. How could she preach forgiveness, she thought, when she is staring into the face of the one that needs to be forgiven? And she can't forgive him. And she said the only thing she needed to do, listen to Corey's prayer as she's looking at this man, this guard. She said this, Father, forgive me for the inability to forgive. Forgive me. Corey said, at that moment, something happened to me. A power that I have never known surged through my spirit. She said, my hand went out to clasp his hand, and the words I never thought I would say to anyone from Ravensbrook is this, you are forgiven. She said, that day, not only was that man set free, I was set free on that day. Folks, when you forgive you may not change the past, you will not change the past, but you do change the future. That's exactly what God is asking us. See, this is what's so important. I was reading the story of the hardest animal to catch in Africa, and it's called the ring-tailed monkey. Biologists said it's the hardest animal. It is sly, it is cunning, and it's fast. Except for the locals, they know how to catch this monkey. And they said, this monkey loves a certain type of melon seeds. And this is all they do. They cut a hole in a tree, a small hole, put the seeds in it. And when that monkey goes in to get the seeds, it is so enamored with its, with its treasure, it says it grabs them, but the hole is small enough that when it makes a fist, it can't pull its hand out. And they show up, the monkey screams, but it won't let go of the seeds. And all of a sudden, now it realizes I'm in trouble. Either what I'm holding on to is going to be my captive, my captor, and it's going to be the thing that's going to bring me into captivity, or I need to finally let it go. Some of you walked into this place like this. And I'm telling you, today is going to be a let go day to finally say, no longer am I going to be held captive in unforgiveness. We live in a culture that holds on until it kills us and kills others. We hold on instead of letting go. I want to help you today. Always remember this. Jot this down. Being offended is a choice. What people do to you, you can't control but you can control if you're going to be offended. See, forgiving others, I believe, is part of God's curriculum for maturing us. 
It is especially painful though, listen, it's especially painful when God uses people that we don't particularly like. It's easier to forgive the forgivable than the, and the repentant, but I don't like forgiving arrogant people that don't think they did anything wrong. And those are the ones that God is asking me, let go. Listen, as we approach Easter week and Good Friday, the day that we celebrate the cross, I want you to think of this. There are three things Jesus did before he died on the cross. He is hanging on the cross and was so active on the cross. Listen to the three things that Jesus did right before he died. One, he prayed. Number two, he witnessed. And number three, he forgave. Look at that. Folks, we don't even do it while we're living. And he's about to die. He prays, he witnesses, and he forgives. Prays to the Father, witnesses to the thief next to him, and forgives those that are on the ground. Notice who Jesus was forgiving. Because he was teaching us a lesson from the cross, listen, on forgiving the unapologetic. I call this, I want you to write down this word, Calvary forgiveness. What Jesus was doing was he was answering an important question with this act of forgiveness. Here's the question. How do you forgive someone who doesn't think they did anything wrong to you? How many have, no, I was going to make you raise, don't raise your hand. <laughs> I, I won't make you raise your hand at all. Remember what Jesus said. He looked at the men that are gambling over his garments, that put him on his cross, that beat him and scourged him, and says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. See, no one asked Jesus to, for forgiveness. No one was repenting underneath the cross, but it was Jesus teaching us to forgive those who feel no guilt, no sense of responsibility of what they have done to us. It's the hardest thing in the world that while they are crucifying him, he is forgiving them. It was the lesson that says you can forgive even when the people don't ask for forgiveness because you don't change the past, but you change the future. You pronounce forgiveness regardless of them wanting it or not. You release them, and listen, folks, and in turn, you let go of those melon seeds and say, God, I'm not going to be held captive by this thing. I want to I help you today. Whether you've been born again for one week or for 10 years, listen to me. Count on being offended by somebody. A spouse, a pastor, a deacon, a choir member, a church member, a, col a colleague, an associate, a firm partner, a dorm supervisor, a professor, a parent. Why? Because there are people, and when there are people, you have problems. Because people have problems. And when people interact, people do and say wrong things. And what may be surprising to some, let me just help you, you can be offended in church. Some of you are going, no, just hang out with us. <laughs> hang out in Times Square Church just for a, a week. And you will find out you can be offended. Because it only takes a minute to cause hurt, but it can sometimes take a lifetime to repair the hurt. See, the hardest hurt to repair is when those who you love and trust that you don't expect it to come from, and it comes from them. My friend from New Zealand, Winky Prattney, a great youth speaker, said it like this. Hurt is proportional to intimacy. Hurt is is proportional to intimacy. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? That the closer you are to someone, the deeper the hurt that comes. The closer you are, that means, folks, listen, I, I've, I've preached on streets all over America. I've been shot at, spit on. I've had bottles thrown at me. I've had rocks thrown at me. And none of that affects me. But just have Cindy look at me the wrong way. I'm telling you, it's worse than a rock, a bullet, and a, and, and a bottle. Just have her go. The, if I get a side eye from Cindy, I'd rather she throw a bottle at me. I'm just telling you right now. Why? Because the closer you are, the deeper, they're, the less they have to do to hurt you. David even said that in Psalm 55, 12. He said, if it was an enemy that reproached me, I could bear it. But because it was my friend, my equal, my companion, 
The one I had sweet fellowship, that was what it hurts. And folks, I have to tell you, I've been on both sides. I've not only been the offended, I have been the offendor. And since we are going to be hurt, we have to do something with the hurt. Now folks, this is huge, don't miss this. Hurt that is not dealt with will turn into bitterness. Don't miss this. Hurt, an offense that is not dealt with will turn into bitterness. Here it is, church. When hurt turns into bitterness is when the chaos happens. This is when it happens. When hurt, let me say it like this, because hurt wants to morph into confusion. It wants to confuse the mind, cloud the mind, cloud the heart. See, a hurt heart is never stagnant. It lives at a crossroad. How, how does, what happens, Pastor Tim, if you don't deal with hurt or an offense quickly? Listen to me now. When hurt is not dealt with, here it comes, then a third party is invited in to your hurts. And it's a party that wasn't there, but knows how to stir it up. Some of you are going like, is it one of my relatives? No. <laughs> Here it is. Listen to this. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, Paul says, while you're still angry. For anger gives a what? Foothold for the devil, which means when you sleep on an offense, you invite a third party into the equation, and it becomes very dangerous. This is what we're faced with. When all of a sudden you think you can sleep on hurt and sleep on offense, it just gets larger and larger. Because you didn't deal with it, you said, I'm not dealing with it. I'm not, until they come to me, that's where Calvary forgiveness has to show up. Because if they don't come to you and it's bedtime, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It says you have till sundown to deal with this thing. You can't let it go. So how do I do it if they're not coming to me? Because we just said, what do you do with the unapologetic and the people that don't think they did anything wrong? Calvary forgiveness. God, I pronounce forgiveness over them in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter. If you can do it from the cross, I can do it from the Bronx. I can declare forgiveness over them right now. Because I'm not opening up this house. Devil, you're not welcome here. This is a place of forgiveness, and we declare forgiveness over this place right now in Jesus' name. So how do you do this? I want to I wanna build on something here for a moment that, that gripped me. How do you deal with that hurt? How do you deal with that offense? I have to start at a very neglected place for these next few moments when dealing with forgiveness because it's the only place freedom can come from. It's the only place freedom can, that forgiveness can come from. When we are dealing with hurt and offense, here it comes, we usually start with what has been done to us and we forget to start with what has been done for us. Okay, stay with me now. Some of you already know where I'm going. We tend to believe that freedom is found in the person admitting their wrong, apologizing, and being sincere. I wanna say that again. We think we can only be free if they admit it, apologize, and then we say, okay, they were sincere, Therefore, I'm free. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is not where freedom comes from the deepest hurts that you're facing with today. We have a hard time forgiving people because we have focused on the horrible event that hurt us instead of the epic event that changed us. We see the wound done to us, not the healing that has been given to us. So here it comes, church. In order to know how to forgive, you must first know how God forgave you. The forgiven are the only people that know how to forgive. This is huge because if, you're, if your forgiveness and freedom, if you're letting go of the seeds, depends upon what the offender has done to you, you're going to hold on to those seeds for a very long time. And this is going to be a day of letting go. This is going to be a day of freedom. This is going to be a day of chains breaking in this place once and for all. 
So I want to explain our forgiveness for just a few moments. See, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need has been technology, God would have given us a scientist. And if our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But if our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness, so God sent us a savior. That's what this is all about. He sent us a savior. And that's why this is so important. It was Carl Menninger, the famed psychiatrist, that said if he could convince the patients in these hospitals that are facing mental challenges that their sins were forgiven, this is Carl Menninger. I, from all I know, he's not even a Christian. He said 75% of them will walk out healed if they would know that they are forgiven. See, forgiveness is hard, even impossible, if you've never felt the forgiveness of God. So that's why I want to just focus on this for the next few moments. And then we're going to drop the sledgehammer at the end. But just bear with me. Don't go anywhere because it's going to get really, really good at the end. So let, stay with me now. One verse on the forgiveness of God. Let me read to you. There's, there's thousands of them, but here's the one I want you to look with me. God says this. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Hallelujah. That is good news for me today. It reminds me of what Horace Bushnell said, that forgiveness is man's deepest need and God's highest achievement. So here's what I've learned from this verse. Let me just build on it, and then we're going to begin to end here in the New Testament. Number one is this. Let me talk about God's forgiveness. God has never turned to anyone's request down who wants to be forgiven. God has never said, listen, his record is 100%. If you ask God to forgive you, good news today. He will forgive you today. Isaiah says it's a shocking forgiveness. Name any sin that you committed today. Good news. God says I can forgive that sin today. He has a 100% forgiving record because it's not based on what you did but who is forgiving you today? That's why he says, I, even I, am the one who blots out your transgression. That's a, that's a strong word when he says, I, even I. It is God that is forgiving. It is a Hebrew form that says, let, when, it, when you see the words, I, even I, that, that kind of redundancy, it is the Hebrew form that says, make no mistake, let's be very clear. The one that is giving you forgiveness today is God himself. It's God that does it. And let's remember this. God is the one that needs to forgive because God is the one whom we've sinned against. The Bible says in Psalm 51, 4, David says, against you and you only I have sinned. We've offended God. But the good news is the same offended God is also a forgiving God and is offering forgiveness to humanity today. A friend of mine sent me this email. I think he said the person was in his church. He said a lawyer, he's from California, he said a lawyer in his church became a Christian and, and it was almost like this Zacchaeus moment. It, it, it seemed he was kind of a shady lawyer. No offense if you're in law, but he just, this guy was, and he's this, it was like this Zacchaeus moment. He sent out 16 or 17 debt canceling letters to those that he said, I want to forgive all their debts. I want to forgive my clients' debts. He said, I have 17. And here's what he said. He sent out 17 debt canceling letters and sent it certified mail. Well, if you know anything about the United States mail system, if you get a certified letter, you have to sign for it. He said, one by one, all the letters started to come back unsigned and undelivered. He said 16 of the 17 letters came back to him because the clients refused to sign for the envelope fearing that the eternity was suing them for their past payments. Only one genius opened up the letter and found out my debt is forgiven. So one person, folks, think about this for a moment. Only one person opened up the letter and received freedom from his debt to this lawyer. How profound. We owe a debt 
of sin to God. He sends us an invitation today to be set free. But there are still people here that won't open up the letter. And I'm telling you, open it up. There is free forgiveness from God himself today. 100% forgiveness record. And what does he do when he forgives? Number two, God forgives so thoroughly that he sees you as if you've never offended him. This is amazing. That phrase blots out this is what blows me away, is, is a present tense. It's not God going, well, let me see if you really mean it. I will blot out does not mean let me get all the details and then decide. No, he says, if you ask for forgiveness, I forgive immediately. You ask me to forgive, I do it right there, and I do everything right there. It's thorough. I was reading the story of an elderly Christian lady who was asked by one of the young ladies in the church, says, does the devil ever trouble you about your past sins? He says, all the time. She says, then what do you do? She says, when the devil comes in, the first thing I do is I say, devil, go east. She's looking at him, she's going like east. She goes, I say, go east. What do you do if he comes back? Then I say, go west. She says, why do you do that? She says, because the Bible says he has removed my sins as far as the east is from the west. And she said, she said, so when he goes east, he can't find anything. And when he goes west, he can't find anything because he has blotted out my sins thoroughly. That's exactly what David said in Psalm 51. He said, according to the greatness of your compassion, you have blotted out my transgression. And I love the next phrase. Wash me. What's the next word? Thoroughly from my iniquity. Nothing left. God doesn't forgive 99% of your sin. 100%. I, I was reading this crazy thing. It said, what if only 99% of the planes landed safely at O'Hare? That, that means you would have two plane crashes a day. If only 99% of the surgeries um, in America, would, would did not result in death, in, 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 uh, only 1% would result in death. They said there'd be 500 deaths after surgery. He said, what do you do if the U.S. Postal Service mailed 99% of the letters? They said we'd lose 16,000 pieces of mail every hour. 1% makes a difference. And the good news is this. God is not a 99% God. He is a God that says there's not one out there. When I blot out your sin, it is gone. It is thorough. It is forgiveness that comes, a forgiveness that's so huge as if you've never done anything before. Come on. If someone has ever done anything to you, folks, I'm telling you, if someone has offended you, it's hard to look at them and not think about that offense. You're just going like, yeah, I, I love you. Get this down. See, we don't forgive people. We put them on probation. We don't forgive them. We put on, yeah, I forgive you, but don't let it happen again. Someone said it like this. I can forgive, but I can't forget is only another way of saying I will not forgive. Let me say that again because some of you missed that. I can forgive, but I cannot forget is another way of saying I don't forgive them. Folks, let me ask you a question. Let me help you on this thorough part. How many here have ever asked God to forgive you of something? Would you raise your hand? Okay. Let me ask you this. How many of you asked God to forgive you of something? It was the same thing you did already. You were coming back to ask for forgiveness again. Yeah, same hands. Okay. Here's the deal. God never says, oh, again? You're back again? He doesn't look at you. God in heaven doesn't go, hey, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. No. Did God forgive you the second time? Did God forgive you the 200th time? That's the kind of God that we serve that blots out our iniquities. He strikes it from the record and says, paid in full, nothing is owed. 
Forgiveness is like a canceled note. That's what it means. It's like a, an accountant coming and scratching it out. And whether, whether the debt was a million sins or one sin, it needs to be canceled out. And the only one that can cancel it out is God himself. He's the only one that can. He blots it out. It was in a dream I was reading in his biography, Martin Luther, the great reformer, found himself being attacked by Satan. He said it felt so real. He said the devil unrolled this long scroll containing a list of all of his sins and held it before him. And Luther asked the devil, he goes, is that all? Is that all you got? He says, no. And he said, he, un he unfurled another scroll. He said, I have these too. And Luther goes, is that it? He goes, no, I have three long lists of all the sins you have committed. He says, but you forgot something on your list, Satan. He says, right out on the bottom of every one of your lists, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, has cleansed me from every one of those sins. Folks, listen to me. That word blot is so important. You cannot blot out, blot out your sins with your tears. They can only be blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can be here. Your crying won't take care of it. Church attendance doesn't take care of it. There is communion that you took today. That doesn't get rid of it. It is the blood of Jesus. That's why we celebrate. That's why 30-something years ago, David Wilkerson said, may this always be a church that every single week we would celebrate communion. We take communion every single Tuesday night to remember that it is only the blood of Jesus that can take away our sins. He is the only one that can ever do that. God sees the Christian as if he's never sinned when he blots those out. Number three, God forgives us because of who he is is stronger than what was done to him. God forgives because who he is is stronger than what we've done to him. Let, let that sink in for a second. He is greater than the sin that you committed. Greater than the offense. Do you understand that there is more grace in God's heart for you than there is sin in your past? That's how much grace is in God's heart. But here's the amazing thing. Why does God forgive us? There's this great phrase in that Isaiah 43, and it just says, for my own name's sake. He said, for my name's sake, I forgive them. I, I, it, some of you are going like, it kind of loses its power a little bit because we, we kind of read over that. He said, I'll blot out, e I, even I will blot out all of your transgressions for my name's sake. What, 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 what is, I think the best version or the best paraphrase to to show you how, what, what, what he means is the message says it like this, but I, yes, I am the one who takes care of your sins. And here's the good part, because that's what I do. <laughs> this, I love that phrase because that's who I am. And that's what I do. I do this. God was saying because of who I am. It's not based on the amount of sin, the repetition of sin or the enormity of your sin. Forgiveness is based on who God is. It's based on him. It's God going for my namesake. It's what I do. God was saying, this is not hard for me because it's what I do. It's my character. That's why the, the one, 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 one person says it like this, where is, the foolish, where is the foolish person who would think it is in the power to commit more than God can forgive? It's not you. It's not the enormity or the repetition of your sin. It's the character of God. That's what he does. That's why there's a phrase all over the Old Testament, especially in Jeremiah and Isaiah, and it always says this. It says, there is no one else like you, or there's none beside me. What he was saying was, you've got to be careful that you serve and repent and worship the true God and not some knockoff religion. The true God. Let, let me explain it to you like this. Do you, do you know... Do you, do you know what a knockoff is? If, if, if you don't, let me explain it to you. Just go outside the church door, okay? Let me explain it to you. There's going to be a blanket out there, okay? And you're going to see a Louis Vuitton purses, Prada purses. You are going to go out there and you are going to see Chanel purses. And you're going to think God has provided only $30 for you. And you're going to go, this is a miracle. God has provided a $3,000 purse for $30 for me. Jehovah Jireh. Okay. 
I want to help you. Here it is. I want to help you. Here it comes. I'm about to shake your world up right now. They're not real. Some of you are walking around wondering why the L and the V is falling off the, the purse and, the, and you can't figure it out. It's not real. It's a knockoff. It means it's, okay, let me help you. It's a fake. It's not real. God was saying, I'm the only one that does forgiveness rights. I'm the only God, the true God, that gives you forgiveness by grace. It's a grace that says you can't get it by crying. You can't get it by church. You can't get it by being good. It comes by the grace of God. How does he do it? Because that's what he does. That's the kind of God that he is. Oh, I read this crazy article from the London Times, and it's, someone sent in this letter that, that says, what do I do? They said, I was a wedding guest, and I was contacted by the newlyweds a week after their wedding, and this is what they said. They said, your gift was not generous enough. <laughs> Listen to this. They said the they, they, she gave them a hundred pounds uh, uh, for, for their wedding gift, and she revealed how the couple who asked for cash gifts, this is what the email said. We were surprised, listen to this, by your contribution, they, they said, and so we suggest an adjustment. <laughs> this is, I'm reading, I'm going like, for real? <laughs> listen to this. She went on to say that the bride and the groom declared, we were surprised that your contribution didn't seem to match the warmth of your good wishes on our big day. And then they added this, listen to this. In view of your new position, if you wanted to send an adjustment, we would thankfully receive it. Well, her new position was she just got an inheritance, and so they were expecting a lot more money to come from this lady. So they said, we, if you want to adjust it, and give us more, we will, we will gladly accept it. Some of you are already thinking what you're going to do if this letter came back to you. Can I give you good news about God? You will never have to ask him for an adjustment <laughs> because when God gives a gift, it is the best gift you can ever get. It is the most amazing gift. His forgiveness comes with a generosity. Folks, there is no one as generous as our God that forgives, that sets free, and that does miracles inside of our lives today. Praise the real God that can forgive us today. Hallelujah. One final thought, but this is not the end, so don't do anything. <laughs> Number four, God has never gossiped about anybody. When he forgives, it's never brought up again. Did you ever talk to somebody that did something to, you know, that they have a problem with, and you mention their name, and they're going, oh, it's them. <laughs> you know there was a problem going on. Hey, I, you know what I saw the other day? I saw Pastor Tim. Oh, Pastor Tim. <laughs> they don't say anything, but they did say something. God says, I will not remember their sins. Corey Timboon, who we talked about her story, said this, when God forgives, he forgets, and he buries our sin in the sea, puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. That's what happens. Listen, listen to this. I was reading... When I thought about those, that phrase, I will not remember your sins. I was reading the story about a priest in the Philippines who, much loved man of God, but had a secret sin from his past that he committed many, many, many years before he entered into the priesthood. And he told his story, he said, I repented, but still had no peace. He had no sense of God's forgiveness. He said, in his parish, there was a woman who deeply loved God who claimed to have such a living relation. She said God would give her visions at times. And he said, I believed her, but I was still a little bit skeptical, so I tested her. I said, the next time, he went to the woman, he says, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your priest committed while he was in seminary. And the woman said, okay, I'll do it. Saw her a week later and said, well, what did Christ do did he visit you in your dreams she said yes he did and he says well what sin did he say i committed he said did did he 
tell you, oh no, let me, he said, and did you ask him what sin I committed in seminary? He said, yes, I did. He says, well, what did he say? He says, he said he doesn't remember. He says, because that's what Christ does. I will not remember your sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He does not remember our sins. What kind of God is this? He is the true living God. Oh my goodness. He forgives thoroughly. He forgives completely. He forgives swiftly. Folks, we all have these trigger switches when people have done something to us. We see somebody, we, with someone, we think about them, and all of a sudden our mind goes crazy. The chaos seems to come in. That it seems like we can get triggered, and every time we pray or hear a voice, it happened. Folks, let me, let me just tell you, as I'm finishing up this message, yesterday it happened to me. I was, I was, I was listening to something on my phone, and, um, and all of a sudden a voice came up that, that many years ago, it's been forgiven and everything. Many years ago, I was, there was a hurt that, was, that came there. And when, the, when I heard that voice of that person, and I'm writing a whole message on forgiveness, my first reaction was to go, nope, I'm not listening to that. Click. And just when I went, the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 no. Keep that voice on. And here's what, what, what I, he says, because it, was, it triggered something inside of me. How many remember this math equation that came from Jesus. Here it comes. Ready for this? 70 times. How many remember that math equation? It's connected to forgiveness. Now listen, this is what Jesus said. Peter came and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven. Peter just goes, seven times? And I love what Jesus goes, no. Seven times 70. Not seven times, but 77 times. Listen, listen to this. Here's what it... Here's what's amazing. This is the part I want you to get. It sounds like everybody has 490 offenses to commit against you that can hurt you. But one of the things that has liberated me from trigger switches, when I hear a voice or I want to click it and go, nope, I'm not listening to that. Probably the greatest insight on this verse really came from C.S. Lewis to me. And this is what he said. He said, it's not 490 offenses. Look at me, folks, because this is going to liberate some of you. He says, many times it's one offense 490 times that you have to speak to it over and over again. Nope, I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. Well, they didn't apologize, Pastor Tim, then it's Calvary forgiveness. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. I don't need them to be apologetic. I don't need them to be sincere. I don't even need them to be repentant. But sometimes, can I just tell you, one offense may take 490 times when the trigger switch comes. How many know what I'm talking about? Like a trigger switch that seems to come. How many know what I'm talking about when you want to click something because you know you're going like, I don't want to hear that voice ever again. And God goes, no, no, no. You, you already pronounced forgiveness. You don't have to live with that. See, the forgiveness of God is, is thorough. It's swift and it's sure. God sees the people who have cursed him every day, who has blasphemed his name each day in the past and yet does not go, oh yeah, that you were the one who said this about me. Not once. When he forgives, he forgives thoroughly, he forgives swiftly, and he forgives surely. Now folks, here comes the freedom. This is what I want to close with. Now this is the real closing, but it's long. Here it comes. <laughs> because this is where freedom comes. So we realize this. God forgives us thoroughly. I, even I, his character have blot out your sin, completely gone, struck and, stricken from the record. I, even I, have blotted out your transgressions. Why? For my name's sake. And I will remember it no more. Folks, how many are sitting here today or watching online? I don't care if you're sitting by yourself, wherever you are. You could be in Norway, the UK, South Africa. But I want you to raise your hand too online. I want you to raise your hand. You could be in Puerto Rico or St. Lucia. If you're here today and say, I've experienced God's forgiveness, would you raise your hand? Okay, you're gonna to wanna to put it down really fast because what I'm about to say. C.S. <laughs> Lewis said this, he says, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have to forgive something. Now get ready. I want you to think of the biggest sin that has been committed against you. What has been the hardest thing for you to forgive? Have you ever turned down someone's request? 
that says, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Here it comes. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Oh, these next two words kill me. Here it comes. Just as. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. I don't like that verse. Because that reminds me, the just as brings me back to Isaiah 43. That's what it does. How was I forgiven? I, even I, have blotted out your transgressions. And I will remember them no more. And then it says this. Put that verse back on, please. Ephesians 4.32. Just as, Isaiah 43, just as God through Christ, has forgiven you. Folks, did you hear that? That our forgiveness, we base our forgiveness on what God has done for us, not on what the other person has done to us. Our forgiveness doesn't matter what they've done. It's based upon what God has done for us. Oh, I knew I was going to get an amen, and I don't need you to amen. Ooh, Pastor Tim, that's good. Right. I don't need your help. I don't need your help. I know I'm preaching the Bible. Here we go. Biblical worldview. You shouldn't have come for the letter F. You should have just waited and skipped a week and showed up. Just as God, just as God through Christ has forgiven you, this is going to mess you up today because he was asking us to act like God. Ooh, Jesus help us. Which means if God would forgive it, then we have to forgive it. Thank you for the golf clap in that section over there. I appreciate that. And what, what comes next is even worse. Because as soon as you go, oh, surely, surely he doesn't mean just like God forgive. Because that's what some of you are saying. Because some of you are so upset going like, that's not what he means. I love what Augustine said about us and our interpretation of Scripture. He says, if you believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like, it's not the Gospels you believe, but you believe yourself. <laughs> that's what it means. Such a great statement. But here's the deal. You ready for this? Because some of you go, he doesn't mean just as God. That's not what he means. Listen to the first two words. Okay, Ephesians 4.32. Then it skips to 5.1. Get ready, because I'm about to mess up your Palm Sunday. Here we go. Some of you going like, you already did. Here it comes. Just as God forgave us. You ready for the next two words? Here it comes. Are, are you ready for the next two words? No, you're not, because here it comes. Next verse. Ephesians 5.1. Imitate God. What? Mimic him. Do what God does. Just as God forgave you, you are to forgive other people. That's not what he means. And Paul goes, imitate him. Oh, Paul. <laughs> you are never more like God than when you are forgiving someone. Folks. Lewis went on to say in that 70 times 70, he said, if, if God forgives us, we must forgive others. Listen, otherwise, it's almost like setting yourselves up higher than him. Did you just get that? Let me leave that up there so you could take a picture of that. Post that. Tweet that. Okay? <laughs> tweet that. Instead of you with a latte, tweet that. <laughs> stop, stop with the selfies. Put up something that will tell, help people. This is not going to help people. Okay. <laughs> Put something up that will set them free. Put that up. If God forgives us, we must forgive others. Otherwise, if you don't forgive, it's like you have set yourself up as a higher tribunal than he is. You're bigger than God. Because he just said, forgive them just as you've been forgiven. Oh, he didn't mean that. Imitate God. That's what he says. This is so huge for us today. So, you know, it's, I kept laughing. I wrote this down. I said, when it comes to imitating God, that's not the one we want to imitate. 
We want to we wanna imitate his sovereignty so we can have power. We want to imitate, God, give me healing so people can come to my meetings. God, I, give me the teaching gift like you had on the Sermon on the Mount so people will follow us and I'll get a whole bunch of followers on Instagram. God, give me holiness just as you are holy so I can be, but we don't want, we don't want forgiveness. We don't want to imitate the forgiveness part because that's the part that goes deep to the core. There's not enough praise in that for us. There's not enough of praise and admiration in us. I will imitate the other God stuff, but don't ask me to do the forgiveness thing. This is what liberates us. You know why people don't forgive? Because you forget how he forgave you. I'm going to say it again. You know why some of you have walked into this place holding on to melon seeds? Because you didn't realize how much he forgave you. He forgives you thoroughly. He forgave you immediately. He forgave you and never remembered it again. He never brought it up. He didn't sit there and look all crazy-eyed when you brought up a certain name and just go, hey, what about uh, Pastor Tim? And God wasn't going, oh, Pastor Tim, he messes up every single day. Look at him up there, spitting on everybody and doing all this stuff. He's just all messing. Let me just tell you something. Every time I go to God this morning and I said, God, forgive me of all, God goes, blot it out. Blot it out. God, why did you do that? Because that's what I do. It's for my name's sake. God, you, don't you remember what I did yesterday? He goes, I don't even remember that because I already made a promise. And then he looks at you and says, imitate that. Imitate that. It doesn't even seem real when I read this story. I I'm going to play the music to make pretend that we're finishing. Folks, <laughs> <laughs> we've got, we've got, <laughs> listen. If I, if I can't empty this, we got, 20 more, one, we got 21 more letters to go. If I can't empty it out on forgiveness, if you still came back after eternity, you got problems. I'm just, seriously, I preached for one hour on eternity and you still showed back up. And I'm going, and I knew I'm going, okay, forgiveness is going to mess you up. You're going to find another church after forgiveness. I said, I just, you go find somewhere. Else. Go find a place that allows you to live in your bitterness. And I, no, I don't want to say that. Okay, let me just, let me go on. This story didn't even seem real to me. When I read about a pastor, I was thinking about our friends from Korea that are here from Seoul. The story I read in 1948 that happened at the, at, it was at the 38th parallel. It was 1948, the, the city was uh, Sun Chun near the 38th parallel, and it was a group of communists that had come over and taken a town, executed a pastor's two sons, Matthew and John executed right in front of the family. They died as martyrs, calling upon their persecutors to have faith in Jesus. Two teenage boys go and serve God. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And they shot both boys in the head in front of the pastor and his family. Later, when the communists were driven out, Chai Soon, a young man of the village, was identified as the man who fired the murderous shots at the pastor's head, uh, pastor's son's heads and killed them. Chai Soon was convicted and sentenced to be executed. Here's, here's, this is just, talk about imitating God. The pastor requested at the court, the charges would be dropped, the boy would be released as his adopted son. I'm reading this, I'm going, that's not true. That's ridiculous. You're asking for the man that killed your son to now be part of your family. Ooh, this sounds like a familiar story. The father asked the people that killed his son to be in his family. Boy, you guys are just not getting it. The father asked. Hallelujah. Now he got it. He, Deron just got it right there. The father is asking, is asking the kid that murdered his son to be his son now. Listen to this. The 13-year-old daughter, Rachel, 
The boy's sister testified and supported the father's request, and the court agreed to turn over Chai Soon into the family. The very young man that murdered sons just a few months before. He came into the adopted, he came as an adopted son of this pastor, and then it says he became a believer. And this is what the story said Did he even have a choice? Because how can you not become a believer when you've been extended that kind of forgiveness? Here it comes, just as God has forgiven you. I have never seen anybody imitate like that before. Here it comes, I am forgiven to be a forgiver. I am forgiven to be a forgiver. Go back to the first slide, get, because, they, because they're, they're so slow with their phones here at this church. I am forgiven to be a forgiver. Number two, I'm forgiven to be an imitator of God. There's another one coming, so keep it up there. Get the phone. Keep them up. And number three, I'm forgiven to forgive like God. That's what it's called. Your reason to forgive is not because the person is forgivable or the offense is forgivable. You're to forgive because you are forgiven. Here it comes. Forgiveness is not just for us but it has to come where? Let me say it again. Forgiveness is not just for us. Forgiveness, you have been forgiven so it can come through us. Do you know why there's so many bad relationships with people? Because they have a bad relationship with God. Listen, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sin, which means if you have a bad relationship with God, you are going to have a bad relationship with people. Some of you keep thinking, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this marriage work. It's going to be my third time, but, but three is a charm. And so I'm going to get this one. I'm gonna, let me tell you, you know, you know why it doesn't work for you? Because you don't have a good relationship with God. You don't need, you don't need to find a man. You need to find the man. You need to find God today. Why does, why, why have men done this to me? Why is, why, why, why is all this stuff happening? Why can't I get along with all these people? Get a relationship with God, and the Bible says, I will give you the ingredient on how to deal with offense, and when people offend you, because if they don't want to apologize, then you forgive them just like God, and you're going to shut down your home from a third party entering into your marriage and say, Satan, I've already, I've already gone to God. I have forgiven and been forgiven. Door is shut here, Satan. You can't come into my home. You can't come into my marriage. You can't come and do this right now, and some of you have been sitting here. Listen to me online. Listen to me. Listen to me, Puerto Rico. Yeah, 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 I'm talking to your people. I'm Puerto Rico right now. Listen, Puerto Rico. I want you to listen to me for a second. Listen. And some of you are corroding on the inside because you're waiting for someone to show up and apologize. And that's not where the freedom is. The freedom is not the person coming to you. The freedom is not the person finally figuring it out. The freedom is I've been forgiven, so I'm going to forgive just like God has forgiven me. And if it means that they never come back to me, that's okay. I'm going to imitate God. I've been forgiven, so I can be a forgiver. Hallelujah. You know what? I'm just going to say it like this. I want you, I want you to hear me now. Balcony. Stand, stand with me. Now this is the real ending. This is it. I'm done. I really am done. This biblical worldview series is wearing me out. But... I've just asked God to keep me alive for 26 letters. I told you that. I said, I just want to stay alive for 26 letters. Here's, I, I am going to ask this today. Some of you, this, this was a revelation for you because you have been waiting for the person this way in your home, in your family, at another church. Some of you are here because you've been hiding out from another church. You're already caught. I didn't know they knew. We know. Hey, listen. Balcony, main floor, annex, 
Those that are watching online, I want you, I want you to listen. Spain, France, listen. This is a day of letting go of the seeds. Some of you have been holding on to that thing for so long, and it's killing you, and you're killing others. This is a day of freedom today. If, yeah, are you playing I Surrender? Is that what you're playing? Yeah, yeah I'm, I, it's close enough. Play that. <laughs> if you're here, and I'm the choir, I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking on this stage. Listen, I don't care if all of you come down. I don't care. We, don't, listen, we can sing a cappella. We don't need, you, it doesn't matter. If it, this is a let go day. This is, we're going to let go today. Because some of you, you thought you had to wait for the person, and that's not what you have to do. You go, God, you've asked me to forgive just like you. Just like you. God, how do I do that? It's Calvary forgive. Today was a revelation day. So I'm saying this to you right now. If this is a let go day, we're gonna, we're gonna, those fists are gonna be, hands are gonna be lifted up. How, how do I know that I'm still holding on to it? As soon as they give you that name, it's, it's, it's the, the thing that happened to me when that, I heard the voice online. I wanted to go, oh, God goes, no, 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 70 times seven, 490 times. Keep, keep saying, God, I forgive, God, I forgive, God, I forgive. I already have forgiven, I already have forgiven. And today is gonna be a let go day. If that's you, just going, Pastor Tim, I got the revelation. I was waiting for my answer this way. The answer was this way. It was this way. Balcony, main floor. This is a let go moment. Revelation moment. Get out. If you're, if you're going like, this is the day. I choose forgiveness. I choose forgiveness. I choose forgiveness. Get out of your seat right now. I want you to walk up here because I want us to pray and make this a final. Quickly, balcony, get out of your seats. I want you to get down here as fast as you can. This is a let go day. This is a let go day. We're going to let go of every offense. We're going to let go of everything that's going on over marriages, over religion, over a pastor, over a church. Whatever this looks like. Balcony, I want you to make your way down. If that's you, Annex, I want you to. Those that are watching online, we're going to get to you in a second. Come on, I want us to get ready to sing this. Come on. You're going to lift your hands as you come, as you walk down. You're going to open up those hands because this is a let go day as we begin to pronounce forgiveness and we pronounce that God is now in charge. Come on. Those that are watching online from around New York City and even around the country. I talked to some of you this week from Ohio and Delaware and around the country that, that, that are with us and those here. I want you to lift those hands. Take the no fists, just lift those hands to him. And I want us to begin just to declare Corey Ten Boone's prayer. And it was just simply this, Father, forgive, forgive me, Father, for the inability to forgive. Forgive me, Father, for the inability to forgive. Come on, let, let the power of God just come over your marriage, over your children. Come on, children over your parents. Over, over maybe what they, what they call today church hurt. Whatever, whatever this looks like. Father, right now, we pray for forgiveness right now. Forgiveness right now. We declare it over households. We, we say where Satan has come in, where a foothold has come in, break that foothold right now in Jesus' name. Break the foothold that has come in. Conversations that are happening around a meal that is, that is taking people to task because all of a sudden a trigger happens, a switch happens, and we start bringing up the past. But today, in Jesus' name, we declare freedom and liberty today. Oh God, for every person that's here today, we lift our hands and say, just as God has forgiven us, we shall forgive others. We will forgive thoroughly, swiftly, and surely. We will not put people on probation, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the remembrance and an eye to what has been done for us, we declare forgiveness over people today. We declare forgiveness over people today. We declare forgiveness in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, lift hands right now and just say, God, I'm not going to be held captive anymore. No more captivity, but freedom in Jesus' name. No matter what they posted, no matter what they lied about us, no matter what they said, no matter what they tweeted, we say, God, you're in charge now. No matter what they told another co-worker at the university or what they told someone in the dorm room, we say, today we got freedom. We have freedom today. Just as God has forgiven us, we declare it today. We don't need them to repent. We don't need them to be apologetic. If they do, it's icing on the cake. But if they don't, just like Calvary's forgiveness, we say, Father, forgive them right now. Forgive them. Now look at me for a moment. Balcony, main floor, annex, watching online. I want to say one of the most important things that you can hear today. 
Nothing is worse than walking in a room and there's an elephant in the room that people haven't addressed. Did you ever do that before? You walk in a room, you're going, oh, I feel it. I feel it like it hasn't been, like there's an, like an apology is needed, but no one's saying anything. How many have ever felt that before? You're going like, someone's supposed to say something, so I'm going to say it. Listen. Some of you are here in God's house today, but you never apologized to God before. And so you think by being here and singing and everything that everything is cool and everything is together, but you've never had a relationship with God today. There's an elephant in the room. You must be born again. You have to have your life changed today. That's the elephant in the room. Because some of you are going like, oh, this is good. I like this church. This is my church. I like that music. I like when that choir sings. I like that drummer. He hits hard. That doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. There's an elephant in the room. None of this means anything if you're not right this way. You've got to get this right with God. You've got to get it right with God. That's why things are eating up. Some of you are going like, why is every relationship end this way? So here's the question. See, God was offended by our sin. And some of you thought that you could just show up at his house today and never deal with the offense, but today we deal with the offense. And here's the, here's the good news. Isaiah 43. I, even I, will blot out every transgression and I will remember it no more. He can forgive you today, but you've got to ask him. It's, it's you. Listen, he has sent you the letter. You have to RSVP. You got to open up the letter. You got to open it up and say, God, if you're saying I can be forgiven of my sin, and I want that today. I want my life changed. I want to, this is the relationship Jesus called being born again. And that relationship can happen right now. Every head up, every eye looking around. I, I know you have to do that at your home because you're the only one that's there for some of you, but I want you to listen. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I don't have that relationship with God. I've not, I've never been born again before. But today I want my life changed. I want to be forgiven by God. In order to be a forgiver, I have to be forgiven. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I want that relationship with God. I want to be forgiven of my stuff. I want to be born again. Wherever you're at in this place, balcony, main floor, annex, around the world, and you say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, when you pray that prayer that allows God to come in and change me from the inside out. Church doesn't change me. TSC doesn't change me. Only God can change me today. And you need his forgiveness because he's the one that's offended. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I want that forgiveness. I want to be born again without any hesitation. If that's you today and say, put me in that prayer. I want to start a brand. I want a relationship. With God. Hold up your hand as high as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Back there, over there. Got you over there, over there, over there, right over here. Got you over here. Balcony, hold up your hands all the way in the corner. You know, let me just say this. For you holding your hand up in the corner, when I pray over the sanctuary, that's the first row I go to. I always go, God, give me people in that row there. So I'm so excited that you have your hand up over there in the balcony over there. Can we pray this together with those online? Pray this with us. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, say it with me loud. Now, God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Hallelujah.